Um, I'm very pleased, too, to come because uh, I've uh, been always very concerned to advance um, uh, Anglo-Irish relationships. Um, I was the minister who was able, largely by disobeying my ministerial instructions, because it was so close to the election in 1997 that I knew I couldn't be overturned, um, when uh, there was the question of the European bubble in order that we would make a common uh, offer for the Kyoto uh, Protocol. And I felt in a very small way I was able to make a contribution to what I would call uh, uh, reconciliation by making the United Kingdom do more in order that Ireland should need to do less. Uh, And it seemed to me that this was a a very important thing to do because it's the only basis upon which we're going to get international agreement in any case, uh, which is that those who can must do more and those that can't must do as much as they can do. Uh, It means that I do actually believe that those who uh, can't do the most have also got to do as much as they can do. One One of the problems always in that is that people then tend to think, well, as I've been let off the worst, I don't... I don't have the same kind of pressure, and I think it's very important for us to recognise that we all of us, big or small, uh, need to take this whole issue seriously. And in the world, of course, Ireland and the United Kingdom are are not dissimilar. We, We are small emitters, if you compare us with the huge... Uh, emissions of, uh, uh, of America or, or, or of uh, China. And so I'm often asked, why, why on earth do you bother? I mean, the United Kingdom is 2% of the world's emissions and uh, doesn't matter. And the answer to that is, is threefold. The first is, is my mother's answer, which is you can't leave it to everybody else. You've got to do your bit yourself. I mean, there's a sort of kind of basic moral issue that you have to... But, but the second thing is that you really genuinely can't ask other people to do things unless you yourself are doing them. And it is much more difficult for countries which are far poorer than we are, uh, even in uh, Ireland's most unhappy thoughts about itself. Uh, you can't compare that with some of these countries that are having to deal with the issue, which you can't ask them to do things unless you are at least doing as much as they are doing proportionately. So there is a, a second reason. The third thing is this. Um, it's all our climate. I mean, what is happening is happening to all of us. And uh, I found it fascinating because uh, I intervened in the Australian argument over the, um, uh, climate, the, 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 the carbon tax and uh, because they hate POMs interfering in their own internal uh, um, uh, politics, I started off by saying the reason I can interfere and intervene is because you're changing my climate, and I'm changing yours, but I'm doing something about it. And in that sense, it is a crucial part of what we are trying to do, is to show that if we want others to join in, we have to do it. And we have to do it because it's an assertion, too, that this is one planet and it's one atmosphere, and there's no point in doing it without (coughs) recognising that wherever you do it has an effect upon the whole world. I I always remember having an argument with the Danish minister, uh, who was extremely self-opinionated about the wonderful offer and things that Denmark was doing. He happened to be Minister for uh, Environment and Energy. And I said to him, I don't understand what you've just done. He said, I don't know. I said, you've just made a lot of fuss in India um, because you've given them a coal-fired power station. I said, and you also made a lot of fuss six months ago in Denmark because you'd closed your last coal-fired power station. And indeed, that was the coal-fired power station you exported to India. It doesn't matter, except the Indians may not run it as efficiently as you were running, because they haven't done it for this. You were very efficient at running it. So you've actually now, all you've done is to transfer the emissions. And you can't take credit for that. It just is the prize example of why we have to take seriously the fact that we're all in this together, to use a phrase which has been rather overused, but we, that's, that's exactly where we are. Now, in, in, in Britain, we have a, 
a, a particularly different system, although it is beginning to be copied elsewhere. The Danes have just uh, taken much the same pattern uh, that we have, uh, and the Mexicans have too, and others are, particularly in South America, are now seeking to copy many of the elements in it. And most of you will know all about it, but uh, it may be of particular interest at the moment because of your own uh, search for a climate change act. And so if I just say what seem to me to be the central parts of this, the first thing is its independence. The Climate Change Committee is a statutory committee which is outside but reporting to Parliament, and it has to be independent. So uh, the chairman and members are all independent, and they can't be sacked for the period in which they are in charge. They can be extended... But that extension as that appointment is really quite carefully balanced. So I was appointed by the uh, uh, Liberal Democrat uh, Minister for Climate Change and um, uh, Energy, the Labour First Minister of Wales, the Scottish Nationalist First Minister of Scotland, and the Protestant Unionist um, uh, First Minister uh, of Northern Ireland. And they got a Catholic Conservative, so it was a pretty independent structure that they ended up with. Uh, But it's a very important mechanism, because it's impossible to imagine in Britain in which uh, that they would all be of the same party. So it just makes sure that you you, you have to be acceptable. Because, of course, you have to be, because your period of time will automatically run over other parties. So I have to be acceptable to the Labour Party, because if the Labour Party won, I'd have to deal with it in exactly the same way. So one has to be independent. I actually sit as a Conservative member of the House of Lords because I've been a Conservative minister and member for rather a long time. And I thought that to pretend that I'd suddenly become crossbencher would look rather silly. Um, But it doesn't mean to say that I haven't always been rather independent on this issue, and one is accepted as such. And the committee is entirely filled with, uh, eight of us, uh, with with people who are uh, scientists or economists. Uh, In other words, Nobel Prize winners and, and, and people of real standing independently. None of them are there out of office. They are all there out of personal scientific ability or economics. It's very important to have uh, economists. So we've got the head of the Grantham Institute from the London School of Economics and we have the um, the uh, director general of the Institute of Fiscal Studies. So that's important because we must show people that we actually understand the price of what we're asking, the costs of things, that how you get to the most cost-effective end. So that's vital. And then we have a a range of um, uh, climatologists and people whose expertise lies in the area of climate and who would be recognised internationally. Uh, There's no doubt that if you think of a former advisor to the British government, uh, um, uh, Australian-born, the... um, uh, uh, now, uh, no longer, but historically, head of a whole series of international um, uh, uh, organisations, who, who is my most um, assiduous and difficult member, because he never lets me off the hook. He says, really? Uh, uh, and then, then you look at somebody like, like um, Sam Fankhauser, who's, who's a Swiss, but he's known internationally as a great, um, um, uh, as a great economist. And then you you listen to my Scottish member, who's not there because he's Scottish, but because because he is probably the foremost climate change uh, expert. Um, and his country. Then I've got a, a fantastic vice chairman, who's uh, who is a, a a woman of enormous standing, but she also is the world expert on aeronautics and uh, uh, not only aviation but also uh, 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 automobiles. Uh, and she knows more about the internal combustion engine than anybody else. It's rather indecently knowledgeable about, about the, what goes on under the bonnet. But she, all this gives enormous strength to what we say. Because the one thing you can't say about us is that we are politically motivated. Uh, you can't say about us that we are um, uh, ignorant. And we have a very good um, secretariat of... 30-plus people who work on both adaptation and mitigation. We have a a separate chairman for 
mitigation, uh, for, for adaptation. Uh, Lord Krebs, uh, again, somebody of in, a natural scientist of very considerable uh, worth, the master of um, Jesus College, Oxford. Um, and he looks after that in order to make the point that we are both in the business of mitigation and, and of adaptation. And he's just reported last week on the next stage of pointing out how the government has failed to meet the realities of flood prevention as a result of uh, climate change. Now, this is a good example of the fact that we are not saying to the government uh, things that they particularly like hearing. And that's why the independence is so important, because uh, we say it as nicely as we can. But we lay down the budgets, uh, five-year budgets, and this is what this latest report has been. It's been the uh, uh, in-depth view of um, what has happened over those five years. And the headline is simply that we have met our targets in those five years, that we congratulate the government, because we've more than met them, of not banking that improvement towards the next budget, but writing that off so that we haven't made it easier for ourselves in the future, but that we have to accept that the trajectory is still not good enough to meet our fourth carbon budget, which is the uh, last of the budgets that we've done so far. We start on the fifth next uh, year, and that takes us to 2027. And, of course, that's necessary because if we're going to reach our statutory target, which we have to, and we're responsible for making the most cost-effective uh, route to that, um, if we're going to meet that target in 2050, then we do have to uh, have a measured route to it. And that's what these budgets are about, creating a measured route to delivering. And, of course, it... Uh, does help a great deal when you know that you've got a, a, an act which is almost impossible to uh, repeal. It passed the House of Commons by the biggest majority that any act has ever had. Eight against it. They're still there. They're still against it. All imagine what it was. Uh, but of course, like motherhood and apple pie, it's all very well until you start doing the things. Then you find that they're all in favour of it in principle, but any of the particularities, of course, you can very soon find a good reason for not doing that. But there's a very great strength to have an independent committee guaranteed by an act which is extremely difficult to um, repeal. Indeed, almost impossible to imagine a parliamentary situation in which you could repeal it. Um, and therefore you do have the ability to overcome the real problem of all democratic countries, which is the short-lived... Uh, life of a, um, of a government and the tendency always to leave things until after the next election. And in that we are all have a common, a common view. And yet we have a, a battle which we have to fight on a much longer term basis uh, than uh, that short term. Right? So how do you balance the, the demands of democracy and the essential nature of defending the planet? And I think we've got as close to that as, as one can do. There are things which one knows, our weaknesses. We, we have, of course, to get our um, pay and rations from uh, someone, and that's the Department of uh, 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 Climate Change. Uh, and one can imagine circumstances which uh, they would be able to screw, the, screw down very tight. They're not. They've been very good on these things, but... But that is always a possibility, so you have to recognise that the more you can make that independent, better. But, of course, one's public position is such that it's quite difficult for people to behave badly because it will be all in the public domain. But it's still true that that is perhaps a weakness. Um, uh, it is a, a cumbersome system that, in the end, if a government uh, isn't able to meet the budget by the means we recommend, they're perfectly able, of course, to make policies of a different kind, as long as they meet the budget. It's the budget that's the important thing. If they didn't meet the budget and their policies didn't work, then they would be open to uh, action in the courts. Not action, I think, that the Climate Change Committee itself would take, but action which somebody else outside would take, which would say, you are statutorily quite required to meet this budget because you've passed it in Parliament, and that is true of all four budgets that we've got so far, and you haven't done it. 
and you put forward alternatives to what was being presented by the Climate Change Committee and you, those alternatives haven't worked. So uh, if it's true that all of us have got to play this game because it's the only game in town, if it's true that all of us are being affected by what is happening, and if it's true that the way you have to do it is to find a mechanism whereby you don't keep on having a start-stop policy because that way we won't achieve it. So uh, though that balance has got to be achieved. I do think that what we've done in the United Kingdom, for all sorts of accidental reasons, um, has seemed to be one of the best ways forward. And uh, we're very keen to cooperate in every way that we can within the European Union uh, and bilaterally as well. Uh, of course, the European Union is crucial to all this. I'm an unashamed uh, Europhile. Uh, it's crucial because uh, we wouldn't have had the Kyoto uh, uh, Protocol if it hadn't been the European Union. The European Union has been in the lead in all these things, and we have to do our best to make sure that it doesn't slip back. It is crucial that the European Union uh, fixes a really ambitious target for 2030 if it's going to be able... Uh, to make the Paris decisions at the end of next year successful. And of course it's true that the Climate Change Act uh, is dependent on working within the European Union and being part of the totality of that. And uh, therefore we have a real role to play, both in the United Kingdom and in Ireland, to make those targets sufficiently strong to enable us to lead in the world. Because again, if the largest trading unity in the world doesn't lead, then you can't expect anybody else to follow. <clears throat> and we are in a much better position today than we were a relatively short time ago. We now have China clearly taking really serious steps to decarbonise its uh, energy production. Uh, partly, of course, it is because you can't walk down the streets in Beijing. I mean, it's partly to do with, with the awful low-level um, uh, air, air, air pollution. But it's also because they believe in climate change and they know in their own country that uh, it's increasingly difficult to have water for many of their major centres. They know that uh, they are getting both droughts and uh, floods in the same year. They've now got a minister for floods because that's what happens all the time. And they see it round the world. And so they are genuinely now taking steps which you could compute as being the most far-sighted in the world. And the underlying argument at the moment is that having shown that they are going to reduce the carbon intensity of their industry in a very sharp manner, they are also now discussing not whether but when they will put a cap on their emissions. Now, nobody could have thought of that even two years ago, but the new administration uh, is clearly determined to make a huge difference. And then you look across the sea and see what's happening with President Obama. Uh, when a country which had been so disappointing is now taking the best measures that it can, and they are very significant measures. And it's always been true that there's been an increasing effort by major parts of the United States, uh, states like uh, California, but the whole, of the, West, the whole of the Western states right up into Canada, because even with the dreadful Canadian government, uh, also a Conservative government, but a, a really dreadful government. But at least, as far as British Columbia is concerned, you have a carbon tax which works. Brilliant idea, by the way. I mean, we should all copy it if we could. Because what they've done is to set an independent committee. Again, independence is very important in this, because people don't trust governments, because they think they're going to use green excuses to do other things. And in that, they're pretty likely to be true. So that's not a bad thing to remember. But this has an independent committee so that when they raise the carbon tax, the independent committee ensures that every penny raised goes into reducing the income tax. So, of course, people then are keen on this because you can avoid the carbon tax 
if you don't drive as much, if you use less fuel. You can find ways of reducing your tax bill, but you can't avoid easily your uh, income tax, and your income tax is going down. So it had been a great success. It was a party political proposal by the Conservatives, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, but the, uh, both parties, uh, indeed all three parties in, the, in British Columbia, now accept it, and it ceased to be a party political argument. So we ought to remember what's going on there, going on around the world. And so the European Union is not out there in front in the same way as it was. It's still a pretty solid leader, but only in the sense of being in the leading pack. Uh, I believe that we were right in the United Kingdom to to, to press for a more uh, tougher target for 2030. Although I do believe that we are better off to have targets which are overall and which are non-prescriptive. I've never been happy myself about the argument that you have to prescribe how much of your decarbonisation comes, for example, from uh, renewables and then define the renewables. It seems to me that's not what we should do. I'm a huge favour of uh, of renewables. But it does seem to me that really you ought to be saying we want to decarbonise our electricity system. And we do that in a whole range of different ways. And some countries, uh, nuclear power will be part of that. In other countries, it won't be. In some countries, uh, it will be very considerably affected by reducing actual demand. Uh, uh, It may well be that uh, smart metering and smart generation will contribute considerably. I don't think you should be talking about a... a, a, I know know this is contrary to Greenpeace. Uh, I'm a heretic as far as this is concerned, but... Because I don't think there's anything particularly moral about uh, renewables. The point about renewables is that they are renewable and that they don't have a carbon footprint in the same way as other things do. But that's that's not the important thing. The important thing is that they reduce your emissions. They They make it possible to fight the battle. And again, we must stop means being getting into the way of, of, of the end. Uh, I, I do not find it really infuriating. You spend time with people and you discover that they, they're not really interested even in renewables. They're interested in solar and everything else is not as good. Mm-hmm. Or wind, because everything else... Or, or, wa- or, or, or wave or tidal or whatever it is. We ought to be in that area. We ought to be in the area of having a portfolio And the portfolio should be added to by the very important issue of uh, energy efficiency and also, uh, I believe, of interconnection. Uh, Because there's no doubt that we really ought to find a way in which we aren't uh, constantly pushed off course by by the difficulty of meeting our peak demand, which is why I've always been very much in favour of more and more connection with France, because their peak is different from ours. Uh, there are three other big connections which, which we need to have. Uh, I'm very keen on the uh, uh, connection with Ireland. It seems to me that that's a, a very sensible thing with Irish wind. I, I want to see the connection with um, Iceland uh, because, again, uh, that provides you with a very important thing because it comes from heat and therefore you do have a baseload advantage there. And I want to see the connection with Norway because, again, you're getting water, largely water generation, which is a a base uh, uh, load uh, generator. So uh, I don't want to be in a situation in which we are prescriptive. I want us to be in a situation in which we're setting budgets and setting targets. Budgets are better than targets because, again, they are less prescriptive. You still have to deliver but your range of opportunities and attitudes will, can, can change. And that's very important, and I want to end on, on two points of this. So the, f- the first important thing is that this is a tremendously exciting experiment because we've never before tried to do today something which will lead to a solution <coughs> right the way forward in 2050. And I think those of us who are enthusiasts for it have to recognise what an enormous innovation this is. And you have to structure things in a way which you can change as you get more knowledge. I don't know, you don't know, how soon, if ever, we will find a cheap way of storing electricity. If you were to find that, it would change entirely the way in which you would proceed. 
because you then have to you get out of the baseload problem in a way which is really staggering, much more important than uh, uh, than carbon capture and storage. But carbon capture and storage would make a huge difference to the way in which we were able to use gas, for example. As long as you don't get a hang-up about renewables and recognise that you could perfectly well use gas if it didn't have the emissions that uh, we have today. So I do hope that people will recognise that although it's um, difficult, uh, it is crucial to have this long-term plan and it's also very exciting to do it. But to do it effectively, you do have to have that mixture of certainty which budgets and targets set but a willingness to be very flexible. Uh, and that means you have to have a portfolio of answers so that you can, in fact, move uh, as science moves and as technology improves. And the second thing, which I think is very important behind all this, is we must stop being miserable about it. I, I really do believe that we are our own worst enemies because we constantly talk about the difficulties and we constantly talk about how hard it is and constantly talk about how dreadful other people are. I want to say something quite different. We are immensely fortunate to be living at the most exciting moment for 500 years. Not since the Renaissance have human beings had to look at the world in such a different way because we now live in a world which has to face a global problem and therefore it has to solve it on a global basis. And that means our relationships with other countries totally change. Uh, I, I was one of the 16 Conservatives who voted against the Iraq war. And I voted against it primarily because I thought it was silly and immoral and illegal, which was quite a big argument. But also because I didn't think we'd worked out something which was very important, which is that you can't win an imperialist war any longer, even if you're on the right side, which we were. But you can't win it. It's the peace you can't get. Because in a totally transparent world as we now have, and in a world which you have to have global solutions to global problems, the only way you can achieve that is by having a different sort of relationship with other countries. And it's the end of imperialism. Uh, mankind has always been imperialist since the first uh, village bashed up its neighbours to get the grazing rights. And, and so don't let's kid ourselves. This is a very, very deep, held human uh, attitude. But we can't be that any longer because you can't achieve what you have to achieve in order for us to exist at all. And I think you can either look on that as the uh, United Kingdom Independence Party, the Tea Party and all other parties of that kind have, which is they, they look at it as a sort of terribly depressing thing. Or you can, as I do, look at it as a wonderfully releasing thing because suddenly... For the very first time, what philosophers and theologians have taught about the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God becomes the necessity of human society. It isn't just, and I'm not using that in an offensive way, but it isn't just a theological or philosophic abstraction. It becomes a practical necessity. And we are the first generation, all of us, to have to make that work. So it isn't surprising that the institutions that we need to do that don't exist, that we have to invent them, that we have to find ways of doing things that human beings have never had to do before. And climate change happens to be the, uh, happens to be the, the way that that has first manifested itself. Although as we look at the shortage of resources, the population increases, the larger number of people able to make choices, as we look at those things, we're going to have to do it anyway. I just want to us to accept that with alacrity and enthusiasm uh, rather than uh, what uh, I'm afraid very often happens is a kind of miserable thought, if only life were like it was when I was young. Well, this is one area which I'm jolly pleased it isn't. <laughs>